Ila, you have to reset the timer. Okay. So the Holy Spirit wants to communicate with you. He wants to partner with you. And He wants to be intimate with you. Now, here's the thing. As, as people of God, we use the word intimacy. But I think that to a degree, some people get a little bit uh, weirded out by that particular word. Just because it's something that, especially for guys, is reserved for their marriage. Something reserved for someone as close them as their wife and it's kind of it feels a bit weird when, when you talk about it however the truth is that intimacy is really something that describes a closeness that is inseparable okay and so I'd like to use for the guys you know a strong brotherly affection or something like that, brotherly love, you know, where you really um, can trust someone else, you can really walk with them, they're always there with you, you know, those kind of things. So what the Holy Spirit is wanting is that deep, deep friendship with us. And intimacy is the avenue to a close friendship. The Spirit of God wants to have a close, meaningful, deep, an an intricate relationship with us. In James chapter 4, verse 5, it says, Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, This is a very important statement, okay? God, He opposes the proud. Now, how many of you would like God to oppose you? This is a New Testament text, right? If you don't want God to oppose you, then you don't want to get into a place of pride. Why? Because pride is the only thing that will stop the flow of grace in your life. The Bible says, God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. So it's important to know what pride actually is. Because there are, there are um, what we would call, there's false humility that parades itself around, and it's actually pride. Some people act so humble, they're proud of it. People will literally say, oh, that person is so humble, But the reason they're coming across as humble is because they're deliberately trying to make you believe they're humble. They're not actually truly humble. And so you have to describe accurately what pride looks like. So one of the simplest ways to understand pride is if you have, at any part of your life, the inability to freely receive what you cannot earn. That is what pride is. Pride is always, whenever you try and do something for someone who is proud, they will always try and earn it back. They will always try and pay you back. They will always try and make a way to make you feel like they don't owe you anything. Because they are proud. Got it? So whenever we come into pride, it's when we realize or when we believe that we've got it together, And we no longer need what God's giving us. Am I right? Because could we ever earn our salvation? Could we ever be good enough in our own strength? Could we ever be holy without the Holy Spirit? So the truth remains that apart from Him, we are nothing. But with Him, we can reach the full created potential that He has placed in us. The the spirit of humility agrees with that which God says. 
It doesn't say anything more, and it doesn't say anything less. So the spirit of humility will sound like those who are always saying less will sound like arrogance and pride. Why? Because people who are humble are confident, not because they are good enough, but because their father has made them good enough. Their confidence is in him. So let's just let's think about this. What has God said about you? In the New Testament, he has given you his righteousness. So according to God, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So if you think of yourself as unrighteous or as less than righteous as God is righteous, then you can come across as humble, but it's actually another form of pride. Does it make sense? See, there are many people in this world who have learned the way of trying to make it sound like they're being genuine when actually they've got another hidden agenda. In fact, some of the people who try and act very loving are actually overcompensating in front of you because behind your back they're saying things that they shouldn't be saying. So it's always important that we keep our hearts right. This is not about judging them. This is about us making sure that we don't stop the flow of grace in our lives. We don't want to be in a place where we think, no, God, don't worry, I'll sort that out. Does it make sense? I'll, I'll, I've got that. Don't worry. You can do the other thing. No, no, no. Everything I do, I do empowered by God. I don't do it apart from God. I do it empowered by God. And if it's something I can't do empowered by God, it's probably something I shouldn't do. Amen? Okay, so... Pride will always bring resistance to grace. Now watch this. He says, God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. What's the first step? Now how do we submit to God? Okay, let me put it to you like this. How many of you would like the devil to run every single time? Okay, then you need to hear the formula for this. This is right here. Step one, submit to God. What does it mean? Find out what God has to say about it and agree completely. In your actions, in your speech, in your life. What he says about it, it becomes what you've chosen to submit to. That's what it means to submit to God. Not your own opinion about it, not what you would like to believe about it, but what he actually says about it. And if you don't like what he says about it, then change. Because there's maybe an area you need to change. Because whatever you are believing prior to submitting to what God says about that area of your life is in agreement with the enemy. You cannot chase the devil if you're in agreement with the devil. You can't tell the devil to leave you when the way you're thinking is actually in agreement with what he says. So the first step is you have to change your thinking and submit to God. Then the second part is resist the devil. He says submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What does resist mean? It means don't change from what you're now submitting to to submitting to the devil. Does it make sense? So you used to think one way, then you changed your thinking to believe what God says. You changed your actions to believe what God says. You changed your speech to believe what God says. Then the devil will try and push you back into the way you used to think and the way you used to speak and the way you used to walk, but you don't. That's called resisting. So submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There's a lot of people who get very frustrated because the devil will come and say things to them and then they'll say this. They'll say, devil, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. How many of you have known anyone who's ever done that? Okay? Do you know what you do when you're saying that? 
Have you noticed it doesn't work so well? The reason it doesn't work is because the word rebuke is like the word to give a speech or to um, make a proclamation. If I said, I make a proclamation in Jesus' name. I haven't actually made the proclamation. I've just made a statement that I'm about to make a proclamation. The word rebuke is describing what you are doing when you are, when you are actually rebuking. It's not, rebuke isn't in itself a rebuke. Rebuke is a description of what you're doing when you're rebuking. So the rebuke sounds like this, get out in Jesus' name. That's what the rebuke sounds like. So when it says, and Jesus rebuked the devils and cast them out, it's actually saying, describing what he did, out was the rebuke. Does it make sense? So when you say, devil, I rebuke you in Jesus' name, he goes, okay, what? Then he's quiet for a while because he doesn't know, like, what are you up to? Like, What's next? You just told me you're going to chase me. How are you going to chase me? What is this? Where am I supposed? What am I supposed to do? What, are you, what is the instruction? And then he comes back and he says, "Well, it doesn't look like you know what you're doing." And then you go, "I rebuke you." And he's like, "What? What? What? What, what must I do? Oh, this person doesn't even know what they're saying, and you're you're an idiot." The devil, I rebuke you. It's like, geez, this guy doesn't want to stop. What is, what is he doing? Are you with me? This is why it doesn't work. This is why you get frustrated. When Jesus rebuked the devil, he said, be quiet and leave. When he was being tempted, he, the devil came to him with one thing, and he said, but it's written. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that is produced by the word of God. Isn't that right? So Jesus, what his rebuke was the word against what the enemy was saying. Is it making sense? So, and please, if you've ever done that, don't feel bad. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to help you go beyond the frustration. Because I used to do that too, and it never worked. And I always used to say, God, why is it not working? Until one day, someone pointed this out to me. And I was like, ah, okay. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> Amen. So, so it's important that we remember and understand that if we want the Holy Spirit to operate in our lives, that we have to submit to God's Word. Because this is the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit's telling you to do something and it confuses you, it's probably because you haven't yet figured out what God has to say about it. Because if you knew what God had to say about it, it wouldn't be confusing. You'd be like, yeah, okay, I understand that now because I understand the Word. That's why the Word is a fundamental foundation for every single believer. So we can see here that the Spirit yearns jealously, okay? And He is jealous for us. The word here isn't, He is jealous of us. He's jealous for us. Now what's the difference? To be jealous of someone means you want what they have. Or you don't want them to go anywhere else. You want them for yourself. Am I right? But the word to be jealous for means that I want you to have everything that you should have. Does it make sense? So when the Bible says God yearns jealously over the spirit he's placed in you, he's actually saying, I am yearning for your spirit to come to its full expression in me. I don't know about you, but that sounds like he's pretty committed. Amen? He is, he is longing for our attention and for our fellowship. We are to draw near to him, and we can initiate that by seeking him. The Bible says, seek me and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Notice it doesn't say knock and knock and knock and knock, and if I feel like it, maybe I'll open the door. When Jesus is making this description, He's not trying to make it hard. In fact, he tells a story about a bad lawyer and a woman who had an issue and how this, well, it's actually a bad judge, not a bad lawyer. So, but they're all bad. So anyway, so the, but this bad judge, right, what ends up happening is 
she harasses him with her complaint to the point where eventually he does what she asks. Okay? Now, God isn't a bad judge. He's a better judge. Am I right? So then if a bad judge would finally hear someone's complaint, then how much more will God not hear your complaint? Amen? So it's not saying that you must knock and 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 finally God will open the door. Jesus is saying if you look for God, you'll find Him. If you seek Him, you'll be there. Amen? All right. So that means that the Spirit is always keen to have relationship with us. Psalm 139 verse 17 says, how precious, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I wake and I am still with you. When you are in relationship with someone, you are constantly thinking about that person. Now God is thinking about us without ceasing. God doesn't need to sleep like you do. So he's got eternity to think about you. Now that's a lot of thinking. Amen? He thinks more about you than you could with anyone you have a relationship with. That means as much as we are committed to one another in our marriages, we can never think as much about that person as God can think about us. And this is not an exaggeration. Because an exaggeration would be a lie. This is the actual truth. You know what prophecy is? It's sharing God's thoughts. That's why you can prophesy anytime, anywhere, because God's always thinking about someone. All you've got to do is hear the thoughts He has for that person and share them. Amen? Consider that in one cubic meter, you get 7.5 billion grains of sand. One cubic meter. Now, Imagine how many grains of sand there are in the whole world. God's thoughts of you are even more than that. You need to get a revelation on this. I'm telling you now, you need to get a revelation on this. As you know, many people exaggerate, like I said, but God does not exaggerate. He, this is exactly what He thinks. In order to have intimacy, you need to seek to know the personality of the one whom you want to be close with. You can't have intimacy with someone whom you don't know, who you don't spend time with, who you ignore. You actually have to spend time with the Holy Spirit if you want to get to know Him. And so what I'm going to be dealing with in the next couple of sessions and tomorrow is, number one, why? Is this thing called the promise? Because I'm sure you all thought it's a bit of a strange name. But it's because that is what God promised. The blessing of Abraham is the promise. If you remember correctly, God said to Abraham, through you, all the nations will be blessed. And that was the promise that God made to Abraham that in spite of the waywardness of Israel, Spite of all the conflict, God brought it about, and we now have the privilege of living in that promise. So you'll understand more about why the promise. Then we'll talk about how the promise has echoes in the Old Testament, all those shadows, where we see how these things reflected in the Old Testament, almost like God was dropping hints. And it's interesting because if you're not paying attention, you won't, see, you won't see the hints. But God is showing us throughout the Old Testament facets of what would be full. And then we look at the substance. In other words, what is this promise supposed to produce in us? Because there's one thing to see my shadow over there, which doesn't look half as handsome as I am. And it's another thing to actually know me. Amen? Right? So, some of you have called me Father Christmas. Just know that. It's because I bring presents.
Okay. So then we will be talking about how God fulfilled this promise that he made. Because often we have the idea that it's still coming. I mean, even the early Pentecostals, they still had the idea that it was still coming. And because of their desire for it, they were able to grab a hold of it. But it had already come. It's already here. There's no need. The only reason why people will tarry, you know, the Bible says, tarry until you are receive power so that you may be witnesses for me. Well, that word tarry means wait. So God, Jesus was saying, go to this place and wait there until you get power. But that was to them. That scripture isn't true for you. It's written there to you, but it's not for you. The tarrying doesn't need to happen. Does it make sense? Because the Spirit is already here. Let me give you an example. After the first one, right, the Holy Spirit is poured out. Then Peter is on the, mount, on the uh, roof, and he's having this marvelous vision of food that he can't eat. And so, <laughs> and he's having an argument with God about it. And God says to him, don't call what I've blessed unclean. And so, right after that, um, Peter sees an angel, and an angel says to him, there's this guy, Cornelius, you need to go check him out. Um, this is in Acts 10, where this all happens. And he, and he needs to hear the gospel. So off he goes to Cornelius' house by the instruction of the angel. And he gets there, and he preaches the gospel. What happens in Acts 10, 38, Peter is saying how God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and setting all who were oppressed of the devil free because God was with him. The Bible says, and while he was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came upon them all. Now the difference was that the first group of people were primarily Jews. The second group of people are just Gentiles. And the Gentiles, these were the guys that, the, that they didn't think were included until this happened. And so Peter says, the Lord has done for you what he has already done for us. But notice they didn't have to tarry. Notice there was no wait. It was just there. In fact, they got it before they were even baptized in water. And then Peter says, who, who can now argue with the Lord? He's done the same thing. Let us not put the Lord to the test. Where is water so that we may baptize you? So they, they did the part that wasn't done yet because the Spirit had already been poured out. Amen? This is, this is pretty amazing to understand that. So, so, it's, so it's very interesting when we realize that the Holy Spirit is super keen to be part of everyone's life. Everyone's life. But He is not an abusive Spirit. And then we'll talk about the Holy Spirit and the, the person that He is. We'll talk about the rest. We'll talk about how this promise that has come to you takes action in your life and how to impact that. Um, we'll talk about how to operate in a, better, in a better way and how to operate in spiritual maturity, how to walk out that spiritual maturity. In the past, people have spoken of spiritual maturity as power or knowledge, but none of these are actually mature because both of them can be pitfalls. In fact, the Bible says that um, a person who's got a lot of knowledge but doesn't produce anything is like a cloud that, that promises rain and the rain never comes. Whereas someone who has no knowledge and just goes and operates in the supernatural can cause more damage as well. So it's important that we understand how these two things are supposed to find common ground and how by the Spirit... They work themselves up. Does it sound exciting? Eh? So now at least you know what you're in for. Amen? Are you excited about that? All right. Okay. Go with me in your Bibles, please, to 2 Peter. Yeah, I'm paging there myself, so it gives you time to get there, eh? 2 Peter chapter 1. 
Verse 1 says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Notice he doesn't start with Simon Peter, an apostle. He starts with Simon Peter, a servant and apostle. Notice that? When it talks about apostles, evangelists, teachers, all those, it says the evangelist, the teacher, the, right? Why? Because it's describing a function, not a position. It's describing what you do, not who you are. The title is not what the gifts are. Gifts are a function. People have turned them into titles, but it's not about titles about function. What is it worth if you are an apostle and you never actually go out and plant new churches? Then are you an apostle? No. You're not operating in the apostolic capacity if you are not going out there, breaking new ground and planting new churches. Because the whole word apostle means the sent out ones. In other words, the church decided those two people, Paul and Barnabas, should be sent out. The Holy Spirit spoke to them, said, send them out. And they went out in an apostolic capacity to go and start new work. Understand? Apostle doesn't mean, oh, high and mighty one. It's a function. It's a function, not a title. What is your highest title as a believer? Son. And for all us guys, bride, right? Because if ladies can be sons, men can be brides. Because we're all part of his body. Amen? So that's our highest title. In sonship, there are things that you've been given by the Spirit that we'll discuss, that you'll see are fundamental to operating as a representative of Jesus on the earth because of how the Holy Spirit wants to guide you. But the minute we put functions on pedestals, then we make one function more important than the other, we cause division. And it causes destruction. Every single person, whether they're doing administration, because those are also gifts, by the way, supernaturally empowered gifts to do administration. Or literally, that's what the Bible talks about in the area of finances, in the area of organizing, in the area of hospitality, in the area of being an apostle, a teacher, evangelist, those are all gifts. All of them are functions. And they all get given to us by the Holy Spirit. So it's very important that we don't turn what's been given to us freely into something that defines us and defines our value. If you are, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh so that we can all prophesy. So some people become very good at prophecy and then they will become prophets and prophetesses. But that doesn't mean that that's a title. It just means that people have recognized that they're proficient in that function. It's a very important point because the church right now is hemorrhaging. I'm talking about globally. Because people can't make the distinction between function and position. And those functions are actually meant to equip you so that you can function. Because otherwise, those titles have to equip you so you can title. And that wouldn't work, would it? If everyone's just walking around with a title, Amen? So then that's why Peter says, a servant. Right? He introduces himself as a servant. And what he says here in verse 2, he says, to those, so who is he writing to? To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. So who is he writing to? People who believe the same way that he believes. Am I right? Would that be you? Is he writing to believers? Yes, he's writing to believers. So he says here, 
to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. So how do we get this right standing with God? We get it because of God. Our faith is in God to give us our right standing. We don't have a right standing that is based on our own works, but one that is imputed to us based on His works. Amen? All right. So we now know that it's talking to all those of us who believe in Jesus and put our trust in Him. Am I right? Okay. Then he says in verse 2, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You know, this word knowledge here doesn't mean just to study and accumulate information. The word knowledge here is the word epignosis, and it literally means knowledge gained through reason of use. That means that as you partner with the Holy Spirit and you learn how He works and how He thinks, that's when you gain epignosis. As you take the Word and you put it into practice and you discern between good and evil, that's when you gain epignosis. So if you want peace and grace to be multiplied to you, you've got to get out there and actually start partnering with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Then he says in verse 3, God's divine power has granted to us all things. So how did you get all things? By your own strength? By your own cleverness? Or by His power? His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Does that mean that there's anything missing? When he says all things for life, then it means everything you need to live. Am I right? When he says all things for godliness, then he means everything you need to be godly. Now if he's saying he's given you all things for life and godliness, is there anything missing? It can't be. Because he just said he gave you everything you need for it. Which means that any prayer that says, I need more to be more, is actually a prayer of unbelief. Are you hearing me? If I pray, God, you need to give me more so I can be more, then I'm saying I don't believe what the Word says. Because the Word says that His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And how do we get access to all these things? Through the knowledge of Him who called us, sorry, to call us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through these promises you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. You know that portion of text right here? It's like um, a fistful, isn't it? Why? Because what, Paul, what Peter is saying here in the first chapter, opening statement to the people who will read this letter, and those people are the people who are already believing in Jesus, he says to them, don't think that you lack anything. You lack nothing. You have everything you need. The minute you believe you need something more, the devil will hijack your lack of knowledge and use it against you. When Listen, you think the devil's demons aren't listening when you pray. You better believe they're listening. Because when you pray, you have authority. And when your words are empowering them to move, then they will operate. Which is why you shouldn't be praying things that are not in line with Scripture. Because you'll end up giving room to the enemy to operate in your life. It doesn't mean he's allowed to. It just means you've empowered him to. Does it make sense? If you find out he's operating, it doesn't mean that he can just now keep operating. You can shut him down. But why even give him the chance? 
I don't think we should give him a chance. Who's with me? Amen. I've got at least five of you. Hallelujah. Okay. So, so then he says here, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Now, what does it mean to supplement? Add to. So he's just opened this whole thing with, we get this by faith in what Jesus has done. And then he says, now add to your faith. But there are things you can add to your faith. Is that right? But they're not things that replace your faith. They're not things that are going to give you more. It's things that you're going to do to exercise what you have. Is this making sense? So watch what he says here. He says, For the very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from becoming ineffective or unfruitful in the experiential knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? It says, well, you've got your faith. You've got to stay virtuous with your faith. Yeah? You've got your faith. That faith has to be based on reasonable knowledge of God's promises and what He has said to you. So it has to be knowledge. Your faith has to be based on knowledge. Right? Then He talks here about self-control. So you've got to your faith has to rest in what God has done for you so that you can operate in self-control. Because self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Then he says here, steadfastness. How many of you have noticed when you start standing on the Word, the devil wants to try and make everything look like it's going to go the other way? And if you aren't steadfast, you aren't going to see anything change. Am I right? So you've got to add steadfastness. And then he says here, and to steadfastness, godliness. In other words, stay godly. Don't act in an ungodly way because now the pressure is on and it's easier for you to do something in an ungodly way to get it done, especially in the world we live in. Stay godly. And then to godliness, brotherly affection, right? And brotherly affection with love. So that means stay focused on the core of your nature, who you are. Don't get distracted. Is this making sense now? Because you can list those things and it's kind of like, huh? But when you, when you see it, as a supplement to your faith, it actually what it do, does is it's actually building your faith up. Are you with me? It's supporting your faith, these things. Because you are allowing your physical manifestation to reinforce the spiritual reality that you carry. What sin does is it does the opposite. It keeps trying to pull you away from the spiritual reality by telling you that you're something that God never said you were. Does that make sense? Okay. Are you guys all okay out there still? Okay, so go with me to James 1. So James 1, chapter 1, James says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. This word servant that they keep using is the word bond servant. A bond servant is someone who has become a willing slave. Not an unwilling slave. A bond servant is a willing slave. So James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes in the dispensation greeting. Verse 2, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And you see that what Peter wrote and what James wrote is very, very similar. The one is telling you that you've got everything for life and godliness, and he's telling you how to get that thing to manifest so that you'll never become ineffective 
And then here, James is telling us, when situations come to challenge your reality, the reality that you're trusting God for, your life and godliness, you've got to stand your ground. Right? You have to control yourself. You have to act virtuously. You've got to continue to be godly. Is this making sense? All right? This is what the Holy Spirit is able to produce in you. That's why our reliance on the person of the Holy Spirit has to be consistent. We can't say, well, I'm going through a hard time now, so now I need to spend more time with God. No, spend more time with God, then the hard times will be easier to go through because you'll know. Am, am I right? Now listen, just because the Holy Spirit is there for us doesn't mean He doesn't use the people around us. The people around us who are also being used by the Spirit are there for us and we're there for them. So it's an interconnected thing where we all are obedient to the Spirit and the Spirit works through us all to help us all. This is how we love one another. And what will the world see when they see disciples that love one another? They will know that you are His disciples. Amen? So the Spirit of God is the key to living the victorious Christian life. He is the one who has been brought to come alongside us. He is the one who has been commissioned as our comforter, the one to teach us, the one to guide us into all things, to make known to us all that is the Father's, that is also the Son, that has now also become ours. How will we if we don't first realize that when we receive Him, we receive everything? I've said this before, on a Sunday service, said, if you were God, you would be sitting with a problem when it comes to blessing someone. Because you've created everything. So you can create something new, you can create another bunch of things, or you can take what already exists and you can give it to someone. Right? But even if you did that, you still wouldn't really be blessing them. They would be blessed but they still wouldn't be really blessed. The only way they could be really blessed is if you gave them yourself because God is the greatest blessing you can receive. So when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive the greatest blessing that could be bestowed upon any entity in all eternity. The gravity of what you actually have is still not fully known to you. And I hope that in the next couple of sessions, you will discover just how amazing the Holy Spirit is and how much He's been doing behind the scenes, even when we haven't really been paying attention, but how much more He can do with us if we are paying attention. Amen? Good. We're going to go for a break. Uh, let's make it 10 minutes.